Yeah. Back there is his lovely wife, Dina. Wave at us, Dina. So you're right now. Yeah. And uh, Mark is the only person still to this day in uh, 32 years of ministry that called me to set an appointment to bring his family in to get saved. <laughs> How often did I wish everybody did that? I'd like to get saved. Can we make an appointment? Uh, sure. <laughs> what am I going to say? No? Yeah, sure. So, uh, and we've been good friends ever since. I thank you. I love you, Mark. Good man of God. He's got a wonderful ministry. Just helping a lot. Of, he's always helped a lot of people. Just so we're glad you guys are here today. Wow, you're a good looking group. Well, I want to start with uh, a little bit of humor, if that's okay with you. I, did you guys ever hear about the Baptist dog? Lee, you're going to love this one's for you, Pastor Lee. Yeah, the Baptist dog. All right, you haven't heard of it. Well, the, there's a Baptist pastor and his wife, and they decided they wanted a dog. So you go to the kennel. They say to the kennel owner, hey, we want to buy a dog, but it can't be just some regular dog. We're Baptists. We're conservative Baptists. We want a Baptist dog. The kennel owner says, what, a Baptist dog? You're crazy. There's no such thing as a Baptist dog. Well, undaunted, you know, they went to the next kennel, and they went to kennel after kennel with no luck. And finally, they went to a kennel on the far end of town. And the kennel owner said, I've got just a dog for you. And he brings out this ugly-looking dog. And uh, he says, Gabriel, go fetch the Bible. Gabriel runs over to the bookshelves. There's all kinds of books. He jumps up to the top shelf and grabs the Bible out of all those books, brings it over to the kennel owner, and he says, okay, Gabriel, find Psalm 23. Bam! He sets the Bible on the floor. It opens. He starts with great dexterity, mind you. He uses his paw. He starts flipping through the pages. He gets to Psalm 23. And he points at it with his paw. Woof! There's, you know, and the, and the Baptist pastor and his wife, they're amazed. And so they just bought the dog immediately. And as soon as they got Gabriel home, they started calling all their church friends. You guys got to come over and see our new dog. This is amazing. He, this dog, first of all, he's definitely saved. He, this is a born-again dog. And he knows the Bible better than most of the people in our congregation. So people are like coming to his house. You know, he's got all these visitors. And he starts showing off this new Baptist dog to his friends. Gabriel, find John 3.16. <laughs> Woof. Right, turns right to it. All right, Psalm 23, Genesis 1-1, find Isaiah 53. The dog is all over the Bible, just like a scholar. And uh, so all the visitors were really impressed. Well, then the head deacon asked the pastor, he says, well, pastor, can the dog do regular tricks too, or just the Bible? The pastor looks at his wife, and uh, we don't know, we never asked. So he turns to the dog, he says, Gabriel, heal. The dog immediately jumps on the table, puts his paw on the, the head deacon's forehead, and starts howling. <laughs> the head deacon falls out under the power of the Holy Ghost, and the Baptist pastor turns to his wife and says, Dear Lord, we got a Pentecostal dog. <laughs> that one was for you, Lee. Ah, oh, there you go. That's right. King James only dog. No, he was a Pentecostal, so he was using the Living Bible. So. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Well, you know, I need to be in a straight jacket once in a while, especially when I start telling jokes. Join hands with somebody. Let's pray so we get into the Word together. God is good. Amen. All right, Father, we just love your word. We love the Bible. We love to get into it. We love to feed off of it. We ask you this morning to feed us by the power of the Holy Ghost. Thank you that you quicken your word. Holy Spirit, do what you want to do in our hearts. We'll be careful to give Jesus all the praise and glory. In his name we pray, and everybody says, Amen. 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 All right, let's start with the scripture. Matthew, go ahead and read Mark chapter 4, 1 through 20, and then we're going to share a few things with you. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. 
As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seen but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path, where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires of other things come and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Thank you, Matthew. Parables are interesting things. They're stories. Jesus told stories. When you, you had uh, little children, Mark, did you ever read to them or tell them stories? Yeah. People love stories right from infancy. Uh, we get older. How many of you like movies? Movies are just visual stories, okay? People remember stories better. I remember years and years ago, Rick Miller, you were there, probably there back at ECA. I, I did this message on the folly of materialism. And I'm sure you don't remember the title. You probably don't remember any of the points. But I talked about these, that I got ripped off getting these Paco jeans, paid 60 bucks instead of 20 bucks for a pair of jeans. For years afterwards, I'd see people on the street, hey, Pastor Mike, you still wearing those Pacos? They didn't remember anything about the message or the title, or, you know? They remembered the story, because I was stupid, and some guy ripped me off in a clothing store. Parables are, are you know, Jesus was very smart. And in that time, everybody knew farming. And so he told a farming parable to get his point across. Now, the first thing you have to understand here this morning, by the way, the title of the message is The Kind of Member Jesus Wants in His Church. The Kind of Member. I want to know what kind of member he wants me to be. First thing you've got to understand is this. Everyone hearing my voice right now, not only in this room, but through live streaming, I want to say hello to everybody. That It's amazing how many people watch us on live stream. Uh, I'm sure Vivian, you watch every week in Colorado. We love you. Uh, Peter, my translator. You remember Peter in Russia, don't you, Pastor Rick? Yeah. Peter uh, watches. He, we're friends on Facebook. Uh, Peter comments sometimes. And uh, we have people all over the place that watch us. We want to welcome you today also. Uh, and I just want to say, everyone hearing my voice today, you're one of these four soils. You're either the hard soil or the rocky soil or the thorny soil or you're the good soil. And if you're hard soil, you are cold towards God. Uh, nothing gets in. The seed of God does not get in. Things that I say will not matter to someone who is the hard soil. You've hardened your heart. If you're number two, the rocky soil means that you're shallow. You may receive the word with emotion. I've seen people cry getting saved, and then you never see them again. Rocky soil is shallow, like the word, the seed gets in. But it doesn't, it quickly is, you know, it dissipates. If you're the rocky soul, you won't sacrifice anything for Jesus. You won't suffer persecution for him. You will not go through inconvenience even for him. And to the rocky soul, even going to church is too much of an inconvenience. I hope you're not one of those first two. The third soil is the thorny soil. If you're the thorny soul, you've accepted the word. But the stuff of the things of this world just keep getting and choking the life out of you. You can't be productive because you're too concerned with the affairs of this life. 
The fourth soil is the good soil, which is, how many of you want to be the good soil? Oh yeah, the seed gets in, it just grows. If you're the good soil, you are hungry for God. Turn to somebody and say, I'm hungry for God. Now turn back to that person and say, well, I'm hungry, and you are. <laughs> but if you're the good soul, God comes first in your life in everything. Amen? Amen? So now, obviously, if you're not the good soil, you are either number one, two, or three. And when you think about that, two obvious questions come to mind. Number one, which one am I? And I'm hoping everybody in this room is thinking, which soil am I right now? The second question that comes to mind is, if you're not the fourth soil, if I'm one, two, or three, can I change? Can I become the good soil? Uh, how many of you know the answer to that second question? What is the answer? Yes. You can. We're going to talk about how. But here's a third question that um, many don't consider. If I'm the fourth soil, the good soil, is it possible for me to go backwards and become one, two, or three? You all say yes, and I agree with you. The answer is obviously yes. So, and I want to remind you um, about something else. The parable itself was told to a large multitude. This was not Jesus' first time through. If you read Mark chapters 1, 2, and 3 leading up to this, you see Jesus all over the place, including in this place. You see him healing people, delivering people, doing incredible miracles, feeding people, feeding multitudes. You see all these things happening. So it was a huge crowd that came to see him. It was so big, they had to do ancient times acoustics. You know what an ancient sound system is like, John? You get in a boat, push it out on the water because it, the water amplifies the sound. And all the multitude is sitting on the beach listening to you. And that's what he did. Okay? And that's why he did it, so everybody could hear him. Okay? But if you look at this passage again, verses 1 through 20, we don't have to look at it, but Matthew read it. It's kind of divided into two things. The actual parable itself. Then came the explanation to the parable. Now, I wanted to say something here that maybe you don't, you don't realize. The parable itself, without any explanation, was told to the large multitude sitting on the beach. But the explanation of the parable was only given to a handful of people. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that Jesus explained the parable only to a handful of people? Well, here's the whole key to everything I'm, I want to talk about today. The key nugget to this whole situation is in verses 10 and 11. And we're going to look at those one more time. Just read them one more. This is verse 10 and 11 of this chapter. When he was alone, the twelve and others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. So, the parable without explanation given to the multitude, then these two verses appear. Then he gives the explanation, and he gives it to... This handful, it, this verse you just read, Matthew, it starts with, when he was alone. Well, was Jesus really alone <coughs> after it was over? In other words, the meeting had been dismissed. Everybody wanted to go, went. And it's interesting, it wasn't just the 12 disciples here. It says the 12 and the others around him. So it wasn't just the 12. Jesus didn't put a fence around himself. Whoever wanted to stay, whoever wanted to talk to him, whoever wanted to hang out, whoever wanted to ask explanation, could have done so. The whole multitude could have hung out. Most of them didn't. Do you know why? Because most of them were there because they had heard, he's healing people. I need healed, or I want to see a spe some healing. Is there going to be a big show, you know, entertainment? Or they were, I've heard that he fed thousands at one of his meetings, you know, just waving his hand. Maybe we'll get a free meal at least out of this thing. By golly, I could go home healed and fed and everything be cool. And, but all the thinking was, what can I get? What can I get from Jesus? And so it started with the, the I was, he was alone, but he wasn't alone at all. He had company. Now the question here is, all right, he told this little handful of people before he gave the explanation, he said this, the secret, everybody say secret. Secret. 
The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Let's just say there were 12 people, maybe another 20. You, 30, 32 people. That's quite a statement. The secret of the kingdom of God. You think that's big stuff? Is that more important information than who wins The Bachelor? <laughs> or how the, the series Lost ended? Or, you know, the, or I'll show you my age now. The, the last episode of MASH. <laughs> eh, shiny. Eh, right, eh, you know, get my false teeth in. and You know, I don't know. I don't have false teeth, by the way. You know, I mean, <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> Thanks, Christian. I appreciate that. This is all my hair too, see? So it's amazing. But um, Yeah, there you go. And so they, these people... St all right, what was the qualification? Why did these people get the secret of the kingdom of God? Which is big stuff. Why did they get it? Were they smarter? Were they more learned? Were they pretty like me? I mean, look at this. You don't get this every day. <laughs> They're wearing great Hawaiian shirts? You've got to admit this is a good Hawaiian shirt. No. Were they snappy dressers like me? No. What was the answer? I heard you guys say. They were seeking as were. They stayed. While everybody left. You have to get this picture, too. They were coming expecting a big extravaganza. Okay, and they didn't get that. Instead, Jesus taught in parables. Most of these people were disappointed. If you read this, nobody got healed, right? <clears throat> there was no big meal that appeared out of nowhere. Nobody got delivered with screams. You know, demons weren't coming out of people. Jesus just sat and taught. You know what he was doing? He was doing uh, what Gideon. You remember the story of Gideon? He was weeding out people that were not hungry. He did, you know, see the, the preliminary stuff, the healing. I mean, it's good. The healings are wonderful. I mean, so much of Christianity places so much value on healings and faith. Well, I mean, those are good things, but there's, there's more, something more to Jesus than that. And you can tell by the way he behaved and the way he ministered. He was looking for people that wanted more, people that would stay. He wasn't lurk, looking for church hoppers. He wasn't looking for people that pop into church once a month or so to say hi. He wasn't looking for, if he were here today physically, he wouldn't be looking for that kind of person in this setting. He was looking for faithful people who could become disciples. You say, Pastor Mike, why do you run a discipleship class? Church is going good, we're getting pretty good crowds, we bought some properties, God's blessing, we've got five acres, everything's going great. We have three houses at church, we have four barns, we, have all this. we just developed all this back area, people are coming... Why are you doing this discipleship class stuff? Because the Bible says go, Jesus said go and make disciples. He didn't say go and recruit church members. In fact, church membership, the way that most churches do it, is not really found in the Bible. Here's what I do see, and this is going to blow some of your mind because we have such a churchy mentality in America what I see is God putting people together. Paul, Timothy, Titus, you see them together? And you see Paul's team, Phoebe, and all, there's 47 people we know of that were on his team of people that ministered with him. God, you know, we see uh, Peter, James, and John. You see Elijah and Elisha. You see Moses and Aaron. In Joshua, you see God puts people together. The name of the Father's house, that's a nice name. How many of you like the name? I like the name. Yeah, it's a nice name. But it doesn't really matter as far as really the kingdom endeavors. The question is, did God, is, did God put you and I, you and me, together? Did God put you and her together? See, who, you know... Dustin, who did God put you with? You see, we, Christian, who are you supposed to be with? Yeah, when there, but there's some you're going to be closer to. Yeah. And, and so what we have to do, and I see this over, I hear stories all the time. When people don't honor what God puts together, 
Remember yesterday, Elizabeth and Joe, I said, what God has put together, let no man put asunder. Listen to me carefully. If God has put you with someone and you know it and you're not with that person, it kind of brings a bit of a curse on you. It's not that, that, any, that person is so special or better than anybody else, but what you're doing is you're disregarding, you're devaluing something that God instituted. Mark, God, we just talked about this. You, God put us together. Yeah. Well, there's two Marks. God put, I mean, I'm looking at both of you. Mark and Mark. M&Ms. They're right there. You can think, as we're thinking about food, it's picnic day. But uh, Mark Powers and Mark Canfor, raise your hands so everybody knows them. God put us together, right? We're supposed to minister together. We're supposed to do stuff together. When we honor what God put together, we don't put it asunder, God blesses. When we dishonor it, and listen, this is just, every pastor I know has these stories. There's people that come to churches like, I'm just a teacher. I'm just, you know, somebody that talks good or tells funny jokes about Baptist dogs or whatever. There's other people that God connects us with. Like I'm connected to Pastor Marr. We talk pretty regularly. I love Pastor Marr. He's a good friend. You know, there's other people out there that I'm connected with. They don't necessarily go to our church, but we try and honor. When you try and honor God, who he connects you with, you know, there, God, doesn't, God doesn't like divorce, Okay. When you go through a divorce, it's very hard. I mean, I don't know how many, I don't want to raise, don't raise your hands. I know a number of you have been through divorce. I have not, but I've been told it's like a death. And people really, I've had a lot of people tell me I had no idea what it was going to be like, how hard and how awful, and the emotions and the, the pain and all the things I went through as a result of this. It's hard. Well, it's kind of that way too when God calls people into relationships. So, it's not about what church you're a member of or how good the programs are. Do I like the preaching? Do I like the music? This is all, the, this is all shallow junk that people think about in the American church. We live in a culture that's very fast food oriented and very shallow. We elect politicians and presidents based on whether we like them or not. We don't look at what they're doing. We look at, oh, do we like their personality? Oh, he talks really good. He's so, he makes me feel good when I listen to him. Okay, but... Did he do anything? Did he accomplish anything lasting? That's what I look at. Because we are a, a country that we have been schooled to look at image and to not look deeper into substance. What is the substance of the person? What are they going to do for our city? What does the mayor want to do? I may not like him, but he, the things he wants to do is going to be good for the city of Norton or whatever city you live in, you see? What's this presidential candidate want to do? Is it going to be good? Is it biblical? You see what I'm saying? Is he doing things that agree with Scripture or do they fly in the face against Scripture? I always vote with the Bible. I've told you before, I'm neither a Democrat nor a Republican. I'm independent. I vote for the candidate. But I want to tell you, if somebody is pro a lot of things that are anti-biblical, I'm not going to vote for them. I don't care what party they're, they're with. Are you, are you with me here? Are you following me? Okay. So, you were right. They were the ones that stayed, and they asked to explain. They were given the secret of the kingdom of God, and that's pretty powerful. And then he made another statement in this. Is it up on screen still? Okay. Look at the last line. The others, Jesus said, were those on the... Whoa. Now we're talking elitism here. You're either in or you're out, Jesus said. You're on the inside or you're on the outside, period. There's no middle ground here with Jesus. So if you're on the outside, how many of you agree that's not a good place to be? So all these multitudes that came for the feeding and the healing, I mean, they were believers to some extent. Remember there's a scripture, folks, that says about God, the devils believe and they tremble. So if you believe in God, that only puts you up to the level of a devil. Amen. For you on the internet, I'm glad you if you believe in God. But I want to encourage you, this, these three words I've been saying lately, 
How many of you remember? Go to church. church. Why? Because Jesus commands it. If you want, say you're a Christian, you want to obey Jesus, what's the three words we've been talking about the last few weeks? Go to church. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We're glad you're watching on the internet. If you're sick or you're far away, praise God, you know. If you're able to go to a good church physically, I really encourage you strongly. If you're watching here live stream or later on the recording, find a good church near you. Be there on Sunday mornings. You can always watch me later. I'm recorded. If you like what I'm doing. If you don't like what I'm doing, throw a tomato at the screen and move on. <laughs> no, it's not going to hurt me. I've got the screen shielding me from the tomato. You know what I'm saying? You know, there's some years ago, Cindy and I went to dinner with uh, a missionary and his wife. And uh, I was trying to minister. They were having a lot of trouble in their marriage. And uh, he was a very talented, very charismatic guy, and he was successful as a missionary. But there's a lot of issues there, too, that had never been tended to. He'd never had been pastored. He'd been in ministry 25 years. No one ever pastored him. He asked me to pastor him. Okay, I will. I'm active. I want to tell you, I, I'm involved. Started pastoring him. He came up for a visit. We had dinner with him and his wife. And he talked the whole time. He talked. The whole time. I, we didn't even know what his wife's voice sounded like after that dinner. <laughs> he talked, didn't he, honey? He talked the whole... And afterwards, you remember what you said to me on the way home? That she said, he could have gained so much from you if he just had shut up. <laughs> if he had just asked a couple questions, you know, you could have really helped him. Well, later on I did. But I did because I said, listen, if you don't shut up, I can't help you. And he started to shut up. And then I was able to help him and, and save his marriage. God used me to thank God to save because that marriage was pretty much over. They were talking about inside and outside. One time I was in the psychiatric unit. I wasn't there as a patient. <laughs> Tatiana and Bob were going, yeah, right, Pastor Mike. Yeah, we know better. Now, real, I was visiting a, a parishioner who had some psychiatric issues. And, and uh, I went to leave then. I was all done. And Rick, I went out the, the other side of the hall. I went, tried to get out the wrong door. I didn't realize it was the wrong door. And there was a big window there. And it was locked. And I saw a nurse across the way, about 20 feet at a nursing station. So I knocked on the window and said, you know, I'm pointing at the door knob. Let me out and void, you know, let me out. I need to get out. You know what she did? She looks at me and she goes, No, no, no. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, Let me out of here. She's like, She goes, It's like that. I'm, like, I'm not, I'm not crazy. Let me out. You know? No, I didn't do that. But uh. then somebody in the unit said, Oh, Pastor Mike, you're in, this, you got to go out the other door. Oh, okay. You know, like, yeah, I had a vision of myself like this, you know, like, this is not good. Uh, but there are those on the inside and those on the outside with the Lord. And what is it that gets you on the inside? What is it that gets you out of those first three soils and into the fourth soil? What is it? And I'm going to just put one word on it so you remember it. It's hunger. Spiritual hunger those people stayed because they were hungry for god there's a reason that you people took the time and the trouble you spent the gasoline money you got a beautiful hawaiian shirt on like brother jim over here <laughs> i love jim that's a good shirt brother let me tell you wave your hands so everybody knows what i'm talking about there you go jimmy gearhart night that rivals this shirt almost bro that's pretty good there's a reason why you put that cool shirt on you came today, Jim. Because you're hungry. And you're getting hungrier and hungrier for God. And it's wonderful to see. It's hunger that puts you into the fourth soil. It's hunger that gets you from the outside to the inside. It's hunger that makes you stay after and ask Jesus questions. And it's hunger that causes people to get out of bed on Sunday morning and come to church to obey 
the words of the Lord to not forsake the assembly. Let me just tell you one other thing while I'm on that subject. Jesus, in Luke chapter 4, he went to the temple on the Sabbath day. 